You know how airport security is. They don't want you to travel wearing every single piece of jewelry you own, but that's what my grandmother taught me, and she escaped Russian army soldiers under cover of night. This might just be the greasy airport food talking, but it's awful here. I feel heavy and drained in that way that one does after excessive drinking or a particularly tedious argument, or both, as was the case last night for me hashing over the same points of contention with my so-called boyfriend. Let's just have a few drinks, he said. We can work this out. If you call misinterpreting everything I say, working things out. Do birds get nauseated? I'm guessing you don't, because you're airborne so often. That would be a real liability, an embarrassing evolutionary misstep. We know, in fact, that evolution makes no mistakes. It weeds out what's wrong and spares the smart and the healthy. Except for that lady in the velour pantsuit over there, the one shoving a meat special bagel down her throat and screaming into her cell phone. The meat special? Is that a good idea? Is that the trait for survival? No, no it's not. <laughs> She's going to stroke out at 57, leaving her family penniless and enraged. But before she does that, I'm pretty sure she's going to reduce the person at the other end of the phone call to tears and apologies because I'm already at that point and I'm 500 feet away from her. <laughs> I encourage you not to blame each other for getting trapped in here. Trust me, it's a dead end. I'm sure you were just looking for grubs and flew in here by mistake. It could happen to anyone. In any case, you two seem very much in love, the kind of love that inoculates you to such misunderstandings and resentments. That's so romantic. As I look at you now, side by side, the sun glinting off your wings, your little eyes fixed on Tio Pedro's tacos, I think to myself, they did something right. They're communicating. They really listen to each other. Life is full of stress, full of opportunities to learn, to forgive, to move on. You're smart and precocious, you two. You've already taken this lesson to heart. And speaking of precocious, I'm guessing that your Spanish is coming along. Como están ustedes pájaros? El vuelo para San Juan está embarcando por Puerto Dos. That must be torture for you, hearing the names of all those exotic locales and knowing you can't go. I feel for you, I really do. But I want to assure you that you're probably safer here. Trust me, I've encountered some fairly predatory behavior in the Caribbean. You need only try to go out for a quiet dinner in Montego Bay to know this. I'm in a different situation than yours in that I chose to come here, rather impulsively, actually. When I finally kicked my ex-boyfriend out last night, I turned on the TV and an ad came on for bargain flights to Europe. There was a montage of European capitals, each more shining and promising than the last. My mouth actually watered. So here I am, headed to Paris on my own. I've always dreamed of visiting Paris, eating my own weight in pastry, wandering the cobblestone streets, meeting a wonderful man. His name will be Etienne. <laughs> no, Arnaud. Arnaud will see me sitting in the cafe in profile and be entranced. He will wander over and ask if he can join me. I will adopt a nonchalant attitude and nod my head. He will tolerate my imperfect French. Coffee will turn into dinner. We will fall in love within days and gamble around Paris together, exuberant at our good fortune, laughing uproariously at the slightest thing, holding hands and laughing and laughing. Meanwhile, you will be here, here in this dystopian outpost with the fluorescent lighting, the smell of travelers' sweat, and the relentless nagging announcements. It's just best to accept this as your new habitat, which it looks like you have despite your desire to escape. That is quite a nest you have built in the light fixture over my head. Is that human hair? Very clever. Well done indeed. I bet your babies will sleep comfortably in there, lulled by the soft murmur of calls on the white courtesy phone. <laughs> I'm just so uncomfortable trying to stretch out on these plastic chairs three hours early for my flight because I couldn't sleep after the fight. I've run through all my snack money and some guy in a TSA uniform is staring at me over his coffee cup. Is he using the cup to read my thoughts? Do they have that technology in airports now? Maybe I'll mouth a cheery good morning to him just to be on the safe side. I want you to know that I would get you out of here if I could. I would slip you two under my jacket and wander through the exit. Then I would release you and watch as you soar away, thrilled with your long lost freedom. But I just can't go through that security gate again. I don't have it in me. <laughs> you are lovely, you pair. You have your whole lives ahead of you, even though you'll be living them in here. The innocent and the beautiful have no enemy but time, a poet once said. Try to remember that. 
Oops, that's my flight they just announced. I've got to get to the gate. I will be thinking bittersweetly of you when Arnaud and I are feeding the remains of our croissants to pigeons on the steps of Montmartre, wishing so much for you the freedom they enjoy, unless they accidentally fly into the basilica. <laughs> Part of my story, Little Big Death. When the doctors ask me what I remember, I close my eyes and repeat my story. Tired of life in the ruins of Western society, of living in a cramped dormitory with hundreds of other sad middle-aged men, I signed up for super death. I went expecting that, like nearly everyone else who takes the drug shiny, I would experience ecstasy, super strength, complete transcendence and freedom from guilt in the past, and death, all within 48 hours. That is the purpose of attending super death, a final superhuman blowout of dancing and sex, ending in blissful slumber from which the attendees never wake up because shiny kills 99.999% of those who take it. It wasn't hard to decide to join them. After the pandemic of the early 21st century, the economic collapse that accompanied it, and the ecological catastrophes that followed that, I had been unemployed for years. Me and hundreds of millions of others. Great legions of us were in prison, legions more were dead. Most of the remainder were, like me, housed in cheap dormitories that had been constructed in dead malls and superstores. There, they fed us cheap, disgusting food, permitted us one hour of exercise per week, and prevented us from reading, writing, or consuming any media other than a single television channel. Blaring in every room, wall-mounted televisions show a supposedly calming montage of nature scenes taped during the late 20th century, set to music from the 19th. The montage lasts exactly 18 hours without repeating. When it flicks on, you go to bed. Sorry, when it flicks off, you go to bed. When it flicks on, you get up and eat. That's life. If that seems bad, consider somebody has to cook the food. Somebody has to clean the toilets and do the laundry. These tasks are not done by residents, as we were called. They're done by workers, government workers. These workers have their own restrictions. They are forbidden to interact with the residents. In any case, they don't, or pretend they don't, understand English. Getting one of those jobs was not possible because the workers were foreign. Going to work for anyone else was not possible because there were no other jobs. Wandering the streets had become less and less possible as police tended to pick people up and take them to the dormitories or to jail. If they didn't detain you, you were sure to be attacked by roving gangs before you made it out of the city. And if you made it out of the city, there was nowhere to go. It was said that there were groups still in the mountains, living outside the system and surviving. But I knew this was not true because in my final job, I had worked for a mining concern. And I learned something that was hidden from everyone. Thanks to the mining concern, the mountains no longer existed. So, despair. And among the many ways of killing yourself, suicide by wall, by self-strangulation, by cop, the alternative of super death is immensely preferable. Not only is it pleasurable and certain, it's free. 
The authorities support it, even though it costs money to stage super death once a week. Because it's cheaper to kill people by the thousands and incinerate their bodies than it is to feed and house them. There's nothing sinister about it. It's not like they turn us into pet food or something. It's just economics. After going through the month-long intake process, during which I signed countless forms acknowledging I wanted to kill myself and being shriven from my few possessions and my legal existence, I received a message giving a time and place. The Astrodome, Thursday, April 5th at 4 p.m. A bus took me there from the Walmart I lived in. No one said goodbye. I entered the arena along with the 20,000 or so other attendees, dressed in my favorite t-shirt and jeans and carrying my last possession, my ID card. At the end of a long hallway is a small room, a hundred small rooms, so they can take a hundred people at a time. The rooms are tiny, the size of examining rooms at a cramped veterinary hospital. And they have two doors, an entrance and an exit, the door of no return. They took my ID card, wrote the number on my arm with a Sharpie, and handed me a yellow pill. They watched it as I, they watched as I swallowed it with a small cup of Hawaiian punch. Without ceremony, they held open the door on the other side of the room. I said, thank you. And the person gave the briefest of nods, not even looking at me. I guess they're trained not to respond, I say, and the doctors say, yes, that's right. The last hallway is completely dark, but I can see light at the end of it and hear booming dance music. I found myself on the floor of the Astrodome, joined by ever-growing ranks of people, the young and despairing, the middle-aged and despairing, the old and despairing. We all stood on the floor, covered, of course, in astroturf, and looked around us. The fading daylight could hardly be seen through the translucent dome, which was lit with blue and purple lights. The largest mirrored ball in the world hung rotating from its center, and underneath it, hundreds of people were already dancing. I've never been much of a dancer, I tell the doctors, but I became aware of a prickling sensation in my spine, and I felt the need to move. I noticed some people running aimlessly around the space like children holding sparklers, and I felt the desire to imitate them. Soon we joined one another, becoming a herd of runners zooming around the space, more or less circling the majority of attendees who danced ecstatically under the mirrored ball. I immediately felt this was the best thing I had ever done. My legs did not grow tired, my feet did not bruise, despite my shoes having been taken away. To run felt glorious. Not only my legs and my lungs supplying oxygen to them, but every cell of my body was also running. It seemed that running had been my vocation, my destiny, all along. And it made me so happy to give myself to it. Time dissolved into a single moment. We were running or dancing, had been created to run or dance, and whatever came before this simply didn't matter. I have to stop there, but um, if you want to read the rest of the story by the book, <laughs> thank you. Across from a parking lot surrounded by a wire fence. 
The man driving turned the ignition off as Susan bent down to see his stocky brown face smile at her. He leaned over and asked in a heavily accented Cuban Spanish through the open car window, Are you Susan Smith? Not used to the Cuban accent, his exact words took a while for, Cuban to un for Susan to understand. But since her own name rang out clearly, she answered him quickly in Spanish. See, si, you must be Alex. He nodded and reached over to unlock the back door. Susan got inside the car, closing the door with a shiny metal handle, then stroked the white ribbed leather seat. Smiling at Alex, Susan asked, thanked him for giving her a ride to his brother Rinaldo's house for her first baton lesson. Alex turned the key to start the motor, but it didn't turn over. Susan could smell a thick, pungent exhaust she suspected the car had admitted. Rattled by the newness of her surroundings on her first day on the islands, she felt a momentary panic while Alex tried several more times to start the car. Finally, the motor turned over. He pulled down the gear stick just under the steering wheel, placed his right arm along the top of the elongated seat, and looked around as he backed up a foot or so. Alex looked forward, moved the gear stick up, and headed on to Cuba Street. Susan sat back in the plush seat and smiled for herself as Alex drove slowly towards the Guanabacoa barrio of Havana, where his brother lived. They continued slowly in fits and starts, the car stalling on a set of railroad tracks that Susan hoped were no longer in use. Alex moved the gear stick down, revved the motor a few times, moved the stick up again, and drove off them. Susan gulped and wiped the perspiration squishy and thick that had formed under her bare legs. She held her hand like a salute over her eyes to try to protect them from the bright morning sun while she read the words on a cart full of sticks being pulled by a bay-colored horse. On the side, in blue lettering against the gray, weather-worn boards of the wagon were the words, El Rapido, quick. Susan laughed. She brought her hand down from over her head, forehead too soon, her eyes getting stunned by the harsh sun. Susan closed her eyes and leaned back to enjoy the soft seat, feeling the, the sensation more fully without her vision. When she opened her eyes again, Susan saw outlines, images of blood splashes on clean white seat. Startled, Susan calmed someone. She realized she was remembering parts of her dream from the night before. How much longer will it be till we get there, Susan asked, nervous. Alex turned around and smiled at her, his eyes glaring. Not too long, he answered. Susan wondered if her question had angered him. Her dream wound its way into her thoughts as she gazed out the window. Something about blood and drums. She'd been trying to play the baton, but people had tried to stop her. The anguish she felt in the dream washed over her as they passed a gas station with small rectangular pumps and a petite white stucco building. The vintage building lightened her feelings and Susan smiled. As Alex drove, passing bicycle taxis, old boys, 1950s cars, and buildings and architectural styles in many areas, Susan tried to picture the young black woman with long curly hair that had been in her dream. The woman had stood and looked longingly at the three men as they drummed. The yearning didn't seem to be for any of the men, but for what they did. Alex pulled up and stopped in front of a mint green house with white columns. Susan shoved open the heavy door and dashed up to the front entrance of the house. She turned around and waited what seemed like several minutes for Alex to join her, then knocked on the door. A large, voluptuous man with a wide chest and stomach and arms bent over and took her hand in his large, dark brown one. He looked neat in his cotton shorts and t-shirt and friendly with his white smile. I'm Ronaldo, he said in a deep bass voice. Are you Susan? Yes, Susan replied and shook his hand with vigor. Thrilled to meet you. Alex in a mesh tank top and large shiny shorts looked at Susan with what appeared to be expectation. I guess I should pay you now, she asked. He nodded. Surprised that the ride cost as much as the lesson would, Susan paid the 10 kooks. Cuban convertible pesos to Alex and thought she'd take the bus from now on. Ronaldo led Susan down a long hallway with floral patterned tiles on the floor, past a room where a couple of large boys sprawled over chairs 
watched a black and white TV. She followed as Renato entered a cluttered kitchen and exited a side door with stairs that led down to a cement patio. On the other side stood a corrugated metal roof supported by wood beams. On the asphalt beneath stood a set of three batadrums, shaped like curvaceous, lopsided hourglasses, pieces of treasure to Susan. A handsome man in his early 20s with reddish brown skin, fine bristled black hair, and mocha brown eyes stood next to them. Ronaldo introduced him to Susan as Dashiell. Feeling a sudden warmth on her back and face, Susan shook his hand and looked at her feet. Dashiell was darling. Ronaldo, Dashiell, and Susan each took a drum and sat down in one of the flimsy white plastic chairs set up in a half circle under the awning. The large green leaves of a tall plant placed in the corner of the awning were lit up by the sun shining on them through the open back of the structure. A flicker of light caused Susan to glance over at the plant with an odd expectation of seeing someone there, watching. The young woman from her dream? Susan shook her head, disquieted by the feeling. Ready to start then, Susan, Ronaldo asked with a big smile. Oh yes, yes, sorry, she answered. Let's play. Since turning her focus to fiction, she's written The Wizard of Ease, an urban fantasy novel set in San Francisco and the Silicon Valley, and several mainstream short stories. The piece she is writing tonight is an excerpt from The Reluctant Bartender. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, but I, I thought you maybe had a question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm helping. This novel is really very interesting and fascinating. It answers that esoteric, age-old question that I know we all need, like the meaning of life type of question. How does a child of an alcoholic end up owning a bar? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to be reading tonight, not writing tonight. Did I write? You did. <laughs> I know I was at a garage sale with my best friend Paige when the phone rang. I can still see all the junk and the woman selling it. I remember the air smell of sunshine and pollen. But I cannot remember what I said or did when the man on the phone told me I had to come to the morgue to identify my father. Not knowing what to expect, I fear fainting. I was afraid his body might be mangled, deformed, or worse yet, bloody. I don't do well with blood. Turns out, morgues are completely antiseptic pretty much detached from reality. Paige held my hand as the guy. What do they call them anyway? Morgue attendants? Pulled my dad out. Well, I said to Paige, he looks a lot better than the last time I had to identify him from the police. Seriously, a lot less blood, she laughed. And no broken glass. I started laughing too. People sometimes laugh at funerals, but how often do they crack up at the morgue? From the look on the attendant's face? Not often. Sorry, I turned to Paige. Come on, this is serious. Sober up. Sober, right, like your dad. The attendant interrupted. Miss, is this your father? I pointed. Let me see the shoulder. Confused, he pulled back the sheet, revealing a long scar on my dad's right shoulder. Yep, that's him. Ah, the plate glass incident, Paige sighed. Good times. As a rule, I avoid thinking about the time I came home to a broken back door and shattered glass. I had always worried someone would break in that door. Just never thought it would be Dad. He was lying in a heap, bleeding and mumbling. Door stuck, tried to push. The paramedics found me holding a dish towel to his wound, wishing my mom had bought dark red towels instead of bleachable white ones. The combined smell of blood and alcohol was making me queasy, and I snapped when the paramedic said, your dad will be fine, but he seems more out of it than he should be. I'd grown tired of euphemisms. He wasn't tipsy or happy or even three sheets to the wind. Well, yeah, I said, he's drunk. The, inter the attendant interrupted my thoughts. Excuse me, what's the plate glass? Oh, sorry. Dad stumbled through the glass of our back door, drunk. His voice was soft. Sorry, that must have been awful. Did he go to AA? What? My dad wasn't sober. He was sober when he died. He died from anaphylaxis, shock, from bee stings. 
He pulled the sheet off Dad's other arm, revealing several stain marks. Well, people don't change. If he was sober, it was only a matter of time before he drank again. Dad didn't believe in a higher power, so he couldn't believe in AA. He'd see those let go and let God bumper stickers and scoff. Ha, better to hold on tight and pull yourself up. Then he turned to me and say, bootstraps, Allie. That's all anyone's got, their own bootstraps. He didn't talk about sobriety or recovery. Didn't even call himself an alcoholic. Just a drunk. Don't look at me like that, it's what he'd say. I did my best dad impression. Still drunk, what a dry one. Haven't had a drink in 17 days. Guess I won't get those updates anymore. I looked at my father on the table, all quiet and pale. I'd never studied his scar before. I traced my finger along it and found my vision blurred by tears. Sorry I wasn't home to open the door for you. Allie, Paige whispered, rubbing a hand along my back. That scar wasn't your fault. The drinking wasn't your fault. I know, I know, I smiled at both Paige and the attendant. My first attempt at the brave survivor smile. Funny that brave survivor has the same initials as bullshit, because that's what I was doing. Dad had trouble believing in a higher power, and I had trouble believing, period. Like father, like daughter. Next up tonight is Joy Morgan Stern. Joy writes about things that she wishes the world had more of. Magic, justice, monsters, and interesting people. <laughs> this is an excerpt from a story called The Farmer's Wife. Once upon a time, in the world of make-believe, there was a kingdom called Storybook. The Storybook was full of princesses and dragons and knights, and marbles and monsters and magic, and adventures and quests and enchantments. In fact, Storybook was famous for these things, but the Storybook was also full of Storybook writers who crafted wondrous tales about knights fighting dragons, and princesses finding true love, and monsters terrorizing villages, and wizards casting spells, and any number of amazing events. Ordinary people, like bakers and butchers and tailors and shoemakers and carpenters and blacksmiths, lived in Storybook too, because knights and princesses, and even monsters and wizards, need to eat and have their clothes and shoes and houses and horses tended to. Sometimes the storybook writers wrote stories about them, like the shoemaker whose shoes wouldn't stop dancing, and the tale of the fisherman who had too many fish. One of these ordinary people was Farmer John, whose farm was famous for its delicious, delicate, delectable cheese. Farmer John's camembert was served regularly at the king's table, and the wizard's club purchased Farmer John's most fine aged cheddar by the wagon load. Farmer John, John lived in a farmhouse which, like all farmhouses in Storybook, was cozy and picturesque and painted red. One evening after dinner, he said to his wife, I read an article in Cheesemonger Today about smoked cheeses. Do you think we should try to make some? I've already set up a smoker in the cheese room, and we'll have some smoked Gouda to try in a few days, replied the farmer's wife. I also read Cheesemonger today. <laughs> of course you do, beamed Farmer John, thinking how wonderful it was to have an excellent wife who understood so well how to run a dairy farm. And I'm sure the new cheese will be delicious. I won't even wait to taste it. I will go to the printers tomorrow and ask him to make a new label. Father John smoked Gouda. I've been thinking, said the farmer's wife. Do you know what I do all day? The farmer looked at his wife with surprise. Of course I know what you do all day. You 
help me run the farm. You milk the cows and make the cheese and cook the dinner and clean the house and weed the garden and... The farmer stopped mid-sentence, confused. What do you mean, do you know what I do all day? In other words, the farmer's wife continued, I do pretty much all the same things you do all day, except that you never cook the dinner or clean the house. Well, of course you do. You're my wife. We run this farm together. We both do farm work. Exactly, the farmer's wife responded. I do farm work. That means I am a farmer, too. But the farm and the cheeses are named after you, and everyone simply calls me the farmer's wife. When the storybook writers write about us, they never even mention my name. Why? Aren't I just as much of a farmer as you are? Why don't the storybook writers call me the farmer and call you the farmer's husband? <laughs> At this, the farmer laughed. Who ever heard of a farmer's husband? He chuckled, and then he guffawed, and then for good measure, he chortled a little. The farmer's husband, imagine! Next thing you know, I know, you will be asking me to change the name of the cheese. And why not, she replied. I am the one who invented the new cheese. It should be called Farmer Jane Smoked Gouda. Farmer Jane Smoked Gouda, he roared with laughter. That is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard, said the farmer. I want a divorce, said the farmer's wife. <laughs> the farmer looked at his wife with shock. A divorce? But, but, but you're my wife and I love you. I know you love me, she replied, but you do not respect me. The farmer did not know what to do or say. He was a good man at heart, and he really did love his wife, and he definitely did not want to get divorced. So he reconsidered. Perhaps I am a farmer's husband, he mused, and then he reflected, and then for good measure he ruminated a little. <laughs> the farmer's husband, imagine. Artifice Comics. The paranormal crime thriller novel entitled Secrets will be available soon through Seventh Window Publications. Thank you. Elizabeth sensed things weren't right, so she worried herself. Behind her, a twig snapped under heavy boots. Goosebumps rose on the back of her neck. She kept her hands relaxed at her sides, ready to reach into her jacket for the hidden can of pepper spray. Hello? There was a sudden sound of scampering feet off to her left. Elizabeth turned to see who it was, but all she saw was an outline weaving in and out of the tree line. It looked male. The shadowy figure with the lanky build and broad shoulders looked primitive as he wove in and out of the brush. His hands looked huge and meaty brushing his knees as he brooded about. Who are you? What do you want? She asked. You wanted me to meet you, so why are you playing these games? The perpetrator raised his arm and a glint of light flashed off a metal implement. Elizabeth gasped, then took a quick step back before running off. She was sluggish and tired, yet she managed to get a bit of distance between them. By now, she was winded and sweaty, trembling with fear. She wanted to look back and see where he was, but she was also too scared to turn around. The shifting sand impeded her speed and slowed her down. It wasn't until she could sense that he was close when she heard him breathing that she plunged her hand into her pocket to pull out the can of pepper spray. The spray hissed out of the can, but he turned sideways, blocking the mace with the hood of his sweatshirt. Elizabeth moved back as he stepped behind a row of trees and scrub brush. What do you want, she called out. There was no reply. I deserve an answer. 
She was afraid to turn her back on him, especially if he was holding something, if. Had she really seen something in his hand? She stepped back, keeping her eyes glued to the row of trees he'd stepped behind. She could turn back and head toward the tram. She was still on the path. She looked down at her feet, then back to the trees. There wasn't a sound, not even a rustle, so she turned around. Without warning, Elizabeth felt a glancing blow connect to her shoulder. No! The blade sliced her jacket and scratched her skin. Stop! She cowered defensively with her hands and forearms covering her face. Leave me alone. When he plunged the knife viciously a second time, it connected with her face and neck. He shoved her and she fell on her back. Gushes of blood spurted over his dark clothing as he grappled with her. Oh shit, I'm about to die. Elizabeth's scream was muffled by her attacker's thick hands as he continued to plunge the knife. What the fuck? Get away from me! Deep red blood pooled beneath them in a glossy puddle. The man bent over at the waist to grasp her by her armpits. He scooped up her body and dragged her off the trail and into a secluded area concealed by twisted pines and gray boulders. You cut me! Elizabeth had been weakened by the attack and struggled to get the words out. I followed the directions on your messages, so why are you hurting me? Her cheeks were scraped and stained with dirt. Her body and clothes were splattered with blood. She had to fight, at least to try to get away. She started to cry. Then she thought she saw the faintest glimmer of a smile. I want to make you suffer, the man said as he stood over her and looked in her face. He had the cold, vacant eyes of a monster. Oh yes, not only is it possible, it's a reality. He pulled the hood off the top of his head, exposing his wicked grin, wild eyes, and flashing teeth. Sweat dampened his hair, plastering some on his forehead. There are only a few more steps before my plan's complete. Elizabeth recoiled in fear as he held the bloody knife aloft. No, you don't have to do this. Just leave me alone. I thought you wanted to meet me. It's too late for that. He scolded her by shaking a finger in her face. I murdered your parents. Next will be your niece. Right now I'll murder you and I'll save Elizabeth, your sister, for last. Elizabeth? He didn't know she was Elizabeth. He thought she was Rose. Her plan to keep Rose safe had worked. She had prepared for everything, yet she hadn't counted on this vicious attack. But she had to intercept that letter. She had underestimated him, and now, true to form, she was in a desperate situation. There had to be a way out of it. She had to get away and warn Rose. You see, I have a plan for this. The killer rolled her into a shallow hole next to a shovel leaning against a tree. He paused to say, Plan might be an understatement. I think obsessed works better. Yes, obsessed. Your father took my life away from me. Now that he's gone, everybody that Elizabeth has ever loved will die, just like you'll die today. He turned toward the shovel leaning against a tree, raising it as if to whack her on the head. She pulled out the stun gun and rammed it into his leg. She pulled the trigger and watched his body tremble from the high voltage jolt. Then, Elizabeth clawed her way out of the hole with her hands, knees, and elbows. She struggled and limped, moving so slowly it felt as if she would never get away. She darted in between trees, through bushes, over rocks, and along sandy trails. Motherfucker! She ran until she could run no further, then fell, panting to the ground. She felt safe after waiting a while, so she sat on the hard ground with her back against a rock partially concealed in brush. This lasted a short time because her wounds ached and she knew she needed medical attention. Some time passed, a half hour perhaps, when she gauged her distance and decided to backtrack back to the tram station. Walking made the pain intensify, so she started to, be, she started to moan and cry. She bit down hard on her tongue, but that only helped a little. There were footsteps in the distance. She paused, held her breath, and then slowly turned to find the man rushing towards her. She tried to, tried to rouse herself, but couldn't move. Thanks for waiting. There was a sharp pain in her abdomen, then a pulling and tear, tearing upward. Die, bitch. Elizabeth gasped then tasted blood. You can thank your sister for this, he said, then took a step back. Elizabeth looked up at his mocking grin as she fell to the ground.
Ng is a mobile designer by day, a writer by night, and an ice cream aficionado almost any time of the day or night. She's writing a book about ice cream. Um, she writes about San Francisco, technology, disruption of the status quo, and her goal is through her writing to explore real and imaginary worlds. Kind of like everyone, right? <laughs> She will read Master of the Ice Cream Domain, a piece about a Turkish ice cream maker. And I've heard this story, it's a great one. And he makes leaps against all odds. Kassar Carly does not worry. In the last few days, the customers at his ice cream shops have been chattering wildly about the protest at Patsy Square. Located on the main residential thoroughfare to the train station on Professor Dr. Ali Nahat Tarwin Street, the shop invites passerby to stop for a brief moment. Like a neighborhood grandfather, Hassar dresses in a modest purple button down shirt and slacks. When he spots a familiar face, he waves with a smile. He watches young adults head to Begaloo with gas masks and large flags featuring Ataturk, the first president of Turkey. As the protesters return, he greets them, addressing them by name and offering a taste of ice cream, a bite progress during their day. I meet Yassar on a summer evening, initially a wild interpreter. Yassar is clean shaven and a light flush emerges from his cheeks. As a devout Muslim, he just finished a fast for the preparation of Ramadan. Energy radiates from his eyes. Seeing an unfamiliar face, he becomes excited. Noticing me, Yassar rises up from the chair behind the counter. His gray hair frames his rosy face as he approaches me, exclaiming greetings in all the languages he knows. As I hand him hastily written in Turkish on a piece of paper, his smile grows wider. Yassar motions me over to the sign, and the sign glares unapologetically, Yassar Stani Dandamasi, English, Master Yassar, Ice creamery, or as a friend knows later, the star, the master of the ice cream domain. <laughs> Tapping a button, he flashes the color buttons, lights on and off. A young brunette scooper in a hairnet translates his words to basic English. He's very happy. Love, ice cream. I tiptoe and point at four pictures on the board watermelon, honeydew, strawberry, and interestingly, a cow. I mean, no preservatives are found here. Everything is made fresh every morning. A young female scooper, no more than 20 years old, expertly scoops the ice cream into a cone. Isar motions me to go behind the metal counter. He opens the freezer, proudly displaying the color bins. and move me to a hidden bin. He pops a small scoop of orange color ice cream on top of my cone. Peach! I exclaim as I take a lift. My interpreter arrives and the star finally has a voice. It fills the table with fresh cinnamon, circular bread with sesame seeds. Like a good Turkish host, he immediately serves black tea and small curved glasses trimmed in gold. I drop a single cube of sugar and mix the tea with a small brass spoon. Orphaned as a child, I saw her live on the streets of Bastansi, a neighborhood in the ancient side of Istanbul. Despite poverty, he searched for ice cream. To him, a small glimmer of happiness. With little education, he knew his opportunities in Istanbul were limited. Watching his friends fall into trouble, Asar became concerned. I was scared to stay, but I was scared to leave everything I knew, he remembers. Everyone thought I was crazy. Armed with nothing but determination, Asar decided to follow his dream to Italy. Sneaking onto a cargo ship, he traveled through Bologna, Florence, and Rimini. There, he tasted all kinds of gelato. Soon he found himself as an apprentice to a gelato maker. To surprise, Yassar discovered that gelato was made with chemicals. Why not just free the sugar, he wondered, when, especially when that tastes better. He entered a gelato contest in Sicily, and to everyone's surprise, he started winning. His recipes were simple, fruit and sugar. Quality, he learned, was essential. Yassar studied under other ice cream masters for nearly a decade. Returning his own neighborhood in Istanbul, he opened the shop in 1971 at an open-air movie theater. Closing the original shop in 1998, he decided to take a rest. Yet his customers still asked for him. With renewed energy, he opened a new shop in 2001 on the busy street. Every morning, I wake up at 4 a.m. I go to the market and pick the freshest fruits. People said that I was crazy that I would buy a kilo of blueberries for 15 liras 
I sell a kilo of blueberry ice cream for 40 liras. But you see, people should always eat the good stuff. He started with his hands together and exclaims, Now, let's eat an ice cream. He scoops tahini ice cream onto a slice of bread. This is my unique creation. The taste of toasted sesame seeds slide down my throat. The savory intensity mellows quietly with the airy bread. I always eat a half a kilo of ice cream in the morning, Star said. That way, I know that it's the best. You should not make your enemy eat something that you don't eat yourself. His wife arrives and places her hand on his shoulder. She smiles. Isar sits up and declares, I feel embarrassed when I see ice cream makers who don't eat their ice cream. You see the five covers there? Pick one. If you find something dirty, even an ant, I'll quit my job and close my shop. But let me tell you this. I believe that there are only three ingredients in ice cream. Love, honesty, and cleanliness. I ask about the future. Isar scans the faces of his young customers. He shakes his head and says, Isar, you said there's a desire for bigger things. When the goal is big, it loses its taste. One should have only one lover. If there are more than one, you cannot know the worth of them. One day, when these lovers start seeing each other, you cannot control them. The sky is dark now. Lights start flickering on the residential neighborhood full of 12-floor apartment buildings. Flags hang down from the balconies. The call for the protests have quieted. Customers still line up for ice cream. I ask about the best memories. Somewhere in 1968, the Hurriyet newspaper, the new national Turkish newspaper, wrote a piece on my shop, Isar says. The first man in Turkey to make melon ice cream. It said, I never knew that they visited me. <laughs> Tears fills his eyes. He looks out at the busy neighborhood, his smiling customers, and his ice cream stand. But today is my second best memory when you came to hear my story. Our next and last writer is a personal friend, an artist at City Art, as well as a gluten-free artist. A gluten-free. Ends by eating my sugar. Um, you'll find him dismantling radios, circuit boards, and putting them back together into really very cool, thought-provoking assemblages. Tony's, oh, I'm sorry, solid work. Tony. He's in the back room here. There's also a tree that we would like you to write. A oh, the tree is up there. A comment on um, the Crossroads theme here. And uh, Tony has been featured in a lot of really cool publications. He's quite the artist with this about writing. Um, in Adobe Books, Back Room, The Bay Times, A and U Magazine, Adobe Books, Back Room Gallery Book, and The Artist Survival Guide. And, uh, He's reading a poem, which is really quite cool. Mm -hmm. Prologue. And man made himself a god. How quick they were to give themselves over to, te to technology, with their gadgets allowing more time for leisure and consumption. The promise of immortality, end of disease, and the frailty of their flesh easily swayed them to, to transition. The shift came in faster and shorter cycles, as the machines discovered new ways to improve themselves. The youth eagerly embraced the crossover. There were elders who feared the changes, while some questioned what this progress meant for the future of man. Arrogantly, science felt it could control the forces of the universe. In the end, whether by choice or by force, they all became together. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia. Nouveau rich, build high. Line their doorways with thorns. Gentrify seen differently when viewed from the other side. Glittered streets once sparkled in the moonlight, paved over with microchips and bones. Stilettos elevate us to a higher plane. Benjamins bought the walls. We cleaned, tight with painted nails. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia. You gave us liberation. New enforcers sweep the streets. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia. You gave us vision. They own the lights. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia. Hello, homogenous city. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia. Hello, goodbye, hello. Gone are the sequined queens. No more leather, leather, leather clad kings. They no longer run the streets. Tawdry Tuesday night scenes are faded memories. Back alley butterfly kisses have fluttered away. 
The bed-stained sheets have been laundered and cleaned. The rebel rallied against the status quo, devolved into a carbon copy clone. Sheep became hungry like the wolf, learned to eat their own. A bounty on your lovely head, rhinestones clutched away. Clip your pretty wings, bound your dainty feet, left you for dead, dancing on your gravestone. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia, you sweetly serenade. They cut your mic. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia, you paint the town, they price you out. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia. Hello, homogenous city. Goodbye, sweet Bohemia. Hello, goodbye, hello. Save us from this homogenous city. Sweet, sweet Bohemia, we're calling you.